Hare Krishna to devotees. For all the participants of this marathon dedicated to the reading of Srimad Bhagavatam all over the world, we are studying these holy scriptures for the well-being of the whole world. We would like to maintain our spiritual and physical well-being equally balanced. It's very important to keep this balance of good health spiritually and physically. When we are healthy spiritually, we've got enough reasoning capacity to maintain our physical health as well. Sometimes people say it's important to uphold the physical body and only then can we take up our spiritual life. Or some people say in a healthy body there is a healthy spirit. But this should not hinder the development of the spiritual or physical health. If we only think that now we would be maintaining the physical body and only then take up the spiritual health, then we might just spend our whole life looking after the body. It's always going to get sick and demands attention to itself, but our foundation should be the spiritual body. For many, the spiritual body in a sleeping state and the ethereal body which connects the spiritual and physical body is the mind, our thoughts and our feelings, all of our karma the good or the bad, it is the time factor between, it's the buffer zone between the physical and spiritual body and our existence in this world. If our spiritual life is not um, being sustained, then the ethereal body will be in command of the physical body, which always demands attention towards itself. The mind will always be thinking about how to maintain the body and without having that knowledge of the spiritual being, the person becomes completely entrapped by the nets of the material uh, desires and how to maintain the body. People spend their times about feeding the body, doing sport, thinking about how to maintain this body. Possibly it's good for the physical body, which is getting some exercise. To a certain extent this is good, but if the mind is always engaged in physical activity, then it will not get any satisfaction. The mind needs some taste. The reason also needs taste, and the mind will not always enjoy the sport and the physical interactions which it is having. The mind always demands nice sensations, and as a rule people can't engage themselves in the same sport for a long time unless of course they could develop some taste for the sport and so in this way we spend the whole time maintaining the body in the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam we are already reading about the story of Maharaj Paranjani as much as he tried to maintain the body the body was attacked by enemies, enemies of old age, disease and death. They took hold of the body and destroy it. As healthy as a person may be, he is eventually consumed by these enemies. But if the person dedicates his life to the spiritual life and to his spiritual self, then that karma becomes completely extinguished. And so the person's spiritual body becomes healthy. The karma is kept in the spiritual body. And this naturally affects the physical body and it becomes healthy. The the spiritual body is wearing this shirt of the physical body. The person must maintain in balance his spiritual and physical body, which should help each other. We will be maintaining our spiritual health in this marathon. Firstly, we will be studying these scriptures and cleanse our karma and our future becomes brighter.
and the physical body will naturally become maintained. There's no other explanation of how disease gets manifested in the body. It's karma. As the person improves his life, the physical body naturally stops becoming diseased. So let us continue with our reading. We are now reading the fourth canto, the deeds of Maharaj Prithu, the incarnation of God, Prithu Maharaj. The fourth Canto, fourth stage of creation, chapter 21. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayana Namaskritam Ramchiva Narotamam Devim Sarasvatim Vyasam Tatojaya Mudirayet Nashta Prayeshva Badrishu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavatyuta Mashloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki The fourth canto, chapter 21, instructions by Maharaj Prithu. The great sage Vidura told the great sage Maitreya told Majura, when the king entered his city, it was very beautifully decorated to receive him with pearls, flower garlands, beautiful cloth, and golden gates. The entire city was perfumed with highly fragrant incense. Fragrant water distilled from sandalwood and agura herbs were sprinkled everywhere on the lanes, roads and small parks throughout the city and everywhere were decorations of unbroken fruits, flowers, wetted grains, varied minerals and lamps, all presented as auspicious paraphernalia. As the street crossings there were bunches of fruits and flowers, all well as pillars of banana trees and betel nut branches. All these combined decorations everywhere looked very attractive. As the king entered the gates of the city, all the, ci all the citizens received him with many auspicious articles like lamps, flowers and yogurt. The king was also received by many beautiful and merry girls whose bodies were bedecked with various ornaments, especially with earrings, which collided with one another. When the king entered the palace, conch shells and kettle drums were sounded, priests chanted Vedic mantras and professional reciters offered different prayers. But in spite of all these ceremony to welcome him, the king was not the least bit affected. Both the important citizens and the common citizens welcomed the king very heartily, and he also bestowed upon them their desired blessings. King Prathu was the greatest than he was greater than the greatest soul, and was therefore worship, worshipable for everyone. He performed many glorious activities in ruling over the surface of the world and was always magnanimous. After achieving such great success and a reputation which spread throughout the universe, he at last obtained the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sutta Goswami continued, O Sanaka, leader of the great sages. After hearing Maitreya speak about the various activities of King Purthu, the original king, who was fully qualified, glorified and widely praised all over the world, Vajura, the great devotee, very submissively worshipped Maitreya Rishi and asked him the following question. 
the Guru said, My dear Brahmana Maitreya, it is very enlightening to understand that King Pathu was enthroned by the great sages and Brahmanas. All the demigods presented him with innumerable gifts, and he also expanded his influence upon personally receiving strength from Lord Vishnu. Thus he greatly developed the earth. Maharaj Prithu was so great in his activities and magnanimous in his method of ruling that all the kings and demigods on the various planets still follow in his footsteps. Who is there who will not try to hear about his glorious activities? I wish to hear more and more about Prithu Maharaj because his activities are so pious and auspicious. The great saintly sage Maitreya told Vajura, My dear Vajura, King Purtu lived in the tract of land between the two great rivers, Ganges and Yamuna. Because he was very opulent, it appeared that he was enjoying his destined fortune in order to diminish the result of his past pious activities. Maharaj Pithu was an unrivalled king and possessed a scepter for ruling all the seven islands on the surface of the globe. No one could disobey his irrevocable orders but the saintly persons, the Brahmanas and descendants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Vaishnavas. Once upon a time, King Prithu initiated the performance of a very great sacrifice in which great saintly sages, brahmanas, demigods, from higher planetary systems and great saintly kings, known as Vrajashis, all assembled together. In the great assembly, Maharaj Prithu first of all worshipped all the respectable visitors according to their respective positions. After this, he stood up in the midst of the assembly, and it appeared that the full moon had risen amongst the stars. King Prithu's body was tall and sturdy, and his complexion was fair. His arms were full and broad, and his eyes as bright as the rising sun. His nose was straight, his face very beautiful, and his personality grave. His teeth were set beautifully in his smiling face. The chest of Maharaj Prithu was very broad, his, va- his waist was very thick and his abdomen, wrinkled by lines of skin, resembled in construction the leaf of a banyan tree. His navel was coiled and deep, his thighs were golden hue and his instep was arched. The back slick hair on his head was very fine and curly, and his neck, like a conch shell, was decorated with auspicious lines. He wore a very valuable dhoti, and there was a nice wrapper on the upper part of his body. Just as Maharaj Prithu was being initiated to perform the sacrifices, he had to leave aside his valuable dress, and therefore his natural bodily beauty was visible. It was very pleasing to see him put on a black deer skin and wear a ring of kusha grass on his finger. For this increased natural body, beauty of his body, it appeared that Maharaj Prithu observed all the regulative principles before he performed the sacrifice. Just to encourage the members of the assembly and to enhance their pleasure, King Prithu glanced over them with eyes that seemed like stars in the sky wet with dew. He then spoke to them in a great voice. Maharaj Prithu's speech was very beautiful, full of metaphorical language, clearly understandable and very pleasing to hear. His words were all grave and certain. It appeared that when he spoke, he expressed his personal realization of the absolute truth in order to benefit all those who were present. 
King Proto said, All gentle members of the assembly, may all good fortune be upon you. May all of you, great souls who have come to attend this meeting, kindly hear my prayer attentively. A person who is actually inquisitive must present his decision before an assembly of noble souls. King Prithu continued, By the grace of the Supreme Lord, I have been appointed the king of this planet, and I carry the scepter of the rule of the citizens. Protect them from all dangers and give them employment according to their respective position in the social order established by Vedic conjunction. Maharaj Prithu said, I think that upon the execution of my duties as king, I shall be able to achieve the desirable obje objectives described by experts in Vedic knowledge. This destination is certainly achieved by the pleasure of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the seer of all destiny. Any king who does not teach his t citizens about their respective duties in terms of varna and ashrama, but who simply exacts tolls and taxes from them is liable to suffer for the impious activities which have been performed by the citizens. In addition to such degradation, the king also loses his own fortune. Pratu Mahaj continued, Therefore, my dear citizens, for the welfare of your king, after his death, you should execute your duties properly in terms of your positions of Varna and Ashrama and should always think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead within your hearts. By doing so, you will protect your interests and you will bestow mercy upon your king for his welfare after death. I re request all the pure-hearted demigods, forefathers and saintly persons to support my proposal, for after death the result of an action is equally shared by its doer, its director and its supporter. My dear respectable ladies and gentlemen, according to the authority statements of the Shastras, there must be a supreme authority who is able to award the respective benefits of our present activities. Otherwise, why should there be persons who are unusually beautiful and powerful both in this life and in the life after death? This is confirmed not only in the evidence of the Vedas, but also by the personal behaviour of great personalities like Manu, Uttanapada, Dhruva, Priyavrata and my grandfather Anga, as well as many other great personalities and ordinary living entities, exemplified by Prahlad Maharaj and Bali, all of whom are theists, believing in the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who carries a club. Although abominable persons like my father Veena, the grandson of death personified, are bewildered by the path of religion. All the great personalities like those mentioned agree that in this world the only bestower of the benedictions of religion, economic development, sense gratification, liberation or elevation to the heavenly planets is the supreme personality of Godhead. By the inclination to serve the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, suffering humanity can immediately cleanse the dirt which has accumulated in their minds during innumerable births, like the Ganges water, which emanates simply like the Ganges water, which emanates from the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord, such a process immediately cleanses the mind and thus spiritual or Krishna consciousness gradually increases. When a devotee takes shelter at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he is completely cleansed of all misunderstanding or mental speculation, and he manifests renunciation. This is possible only when one is strengthened by practicing bhakti yoga. 
once having taken shelter at the root of the lotus feet of the Lord, a devotee never comes back to this material existence, which is full of the threefold miseries. Bhartu Maharaj advised his citizens, engage in your minds, your words, your bodies, and the results of your occupational duties, and being always open-minded, you should all render devotional service to the Lord according to your abilities and the occupations in which you are situated. You should engage your service at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead with full confidence and without reservation, when you will surely be successful in achieving the full objective in your lives. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is transcendental and non-contaminated by this material world, but although he is concentrated spirit soul without material variety, for the benefit of the conditioned soul, he nevertheless accepts different types of sacrifices performed with various material elements, rituals and mantras, and offered by the demigods under different names according to the interests and person purposes of the performers. The Supreme Personality of God is all-pervading, but He is also manifested in different types of bodies. Which arise from a combination of material nature, time, desire, and occupational duties. Thus, different types of consciousness develop, just as fire, which is always basically the same, blazes in different ways according to the shape and dimensions of firewood. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the master and enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices, and he is the Supreme Spiritual Master as well. All of you citizens on the surface of the globe who have a relationship with me and are worshipped, worshipping him by dint of your occupational duties are bestowing your mercy upon me. Therefore, O oh my citizens, I thank you. The Brahmanas and Vaishnavas are personally glorified by their characteristics, powers of tolerance, penance, knowledge and education. By dint of all these spiritual assets, Vaishnavas are more powerful than royalty. It is therefore advised that the princely order not exhibit its material power before these two communities and should avoid offending them. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ancient, eternal Godhead, who is foremost among all great personalities, obtained the opulence of his staunch reputation which purifies the entire universe by worshipping the lotus feet of those Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is everlastingly independent and who exists in everyone's heart, is very pleased with those who follow in his footsteps and engage without reservation in the service of the descendants of Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, for he is always dear to Brahmanas and Vaishnavas and they are always dear to him. By regular service to the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, one can clear the dirt from his heart and thus enjoy supreme peace and liberation from material attachment and be satisfied. In this world, there is no fruitive activity superior to serving the Brahmana class, for this can bring pleasure to the demigods, for whom the many sacrifices are recommended. Although the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Ananta, eats through the fire sacrifices offered in the names of the different demigods, he does not take as much pleasure in eating through fire as he does in accepting offerings through the mouth of learned sages and devotees, for then he does not leave the association of devotees. Совершают аскезы, 
In Brahminical culture, a Brahmana's transcendental position is eternally maintained because the injunctions of the Vedas are accepted with faith, austerity, scriptural conclusions, full sense and mind control and meditation. In this way, the real goal of life is illuminated, just as one's face is fully reflected in a clear mirror. O oh, respectable personalities present here, I beg the blessings of all of you that I may perpetually carry on my crown, the dust of the lotus feet of such Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, until the end of my life. He who can carry such dust on his head is very soon relieved of all the reactions which arise from sinful life, and eventually he develops all good, desirable qualities. Whoever acquires the Brahminical qualifications, whose only wealth is good behaviour, who is grateful and who takes shelter of experienced persons, gets all the opulence of the world. I therefore wish that the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his associates be pleased with the Brahmana's class, with the cows and with me. The great sage Maitreya said, after hearing King Partu speak so nicely, all the demigods, the denizens of Pitraloka, the Brahmanas and the saintly persons present at the meeting congr congratulated him by expressing their goodwill. They all declared that the Vedic conclusions that one can conquer the heavenly planets by the actions of Putra or Sun was fulfilled for the most sinful Vena, who had been killed by the curse of the Brahmanas, was now delivered from the darkest region of hellish life by his son Maharaj Partu. Similarly, Hiranyakashipu, who by the dint of his sinful activities always defied the supremacy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, entered into the darkest region of hellish life. But by the grace of his great son Prahlad Maharaj, he also was delivered and went back home, back to Godhead. All the saintly Brahmanas thus addressed Prahlad Maharaj, O best of the warriors, O father of this globe, may you be blessed with a long life, for you have great devotion to the infallible Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the master of all the universe. The audience continued. Dear King Partu, your reputation is the purest of all, for you are preaching the glories of the most glorious of all, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord of the Brahmanas. Since due to our great fortune we have you as our master, we think that we are living directly under the agency of the Lord. Our dear Lord, it is your occupational duty to rule over your citizens. That is not a very wonderful task for a personality like you, who are so affectionate and seeing to the interests of the citizens, because you are full of mercy. That is the greatest of your character. The citizen continued, Today you have opened our eyes and revealed how to cross to the other side of the ocean of darkness by our past deeds and by the arrangement of superior author authority. We are entangled in a network of fruitive activities and have lost sight of the destination of life. Thus we have been wandering within the universe. Dear Lord, you are situated in your pure existential position of goodness. Therefore, you are the perfect representation of the Supreme Lord. You are glorious. You are glorified by your own prowess, and thus you are maintaining the entire world by introducing Brahminical culture and protecting everything in your line of duty as a Kshatriya. End of chapter 21. Chapter 22 Prithu Maharaj meeting with the four Kumaras
The great sage Maitreya said, while the citizens were thus praying to the most powerful King Prutu, the four Kumaras, who were as bright as the sun, arrived on the spot. Seeing the glowing effulgence of the four Kumaras, the masters of the mystic power, the king and his associates could recognize them as they descended from the sky. Seeing the four Kumaras, Prutu Maharaj was greatly anxious to receive them. Therefore the king, with all his officers, very hastily got up, so anxiously as a conditioned soul whose senses are immediately attracted by the modes of material nature. When the great sage accepted their reception, according to the instructions of the Shastras, and finally took their seats offer, offered by the king, the king, influenced by the glories of the sages, immediately bowed down. Thus he worshipped the four Kumaras. After this, the king took the water which had washed the lotus feet of the Kumaras and sprinkled it over his hair. By such respectful actions, the king as an exemplary personality showed how to receive a spiritually advanced person. The four great sages were elder to Lord Shiva, and when they were seated on the golden throne they appeared just like blazing on an altar. Maharaj Purtu, out of his great gentleness and respect for them, began, began to speak with great restraint as follows. King Pertu spoke, My dear great sages, auspiciousness personified, it is very difficult for even the mystic yogis to see you. Indeed, you are very rarely seen. I do not know what kind of pious activity I performed for you to grace me by appearing before me without difficulty. Any person upon whom the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas are pleased can achieve anything which is very rare to obtain in this world, as well as after death. Not only that, but one also receives the favour of the auspicious Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu who accompany the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. Purtu Maharaj continued, Although you are travelling in all planetary systems, people cannot know you, just as they cannot know the Super Soul, although he is within everyone's heart, as the witness of everything. Even Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva cannot understand the Super Soul. A person who is not very rich is attached to family life, becomes highly glorified when saintly persons are present in his home. The master and servants of who are engaged in offering the exalted visitor's water, a sitting place, and paraphernalia for reception are glorified, and the home itself is also glorified. On the contrary, even though full of opulence and material prosperity, any householder's house where the devotees of the Lord are never allowed to come in, and where there is no water for washing their feet, is to be considered a tree in which all venomous serpents live. Maharaj Purtu offered his welcome to the four Kumaras, addressing them as the best of the Brahmanas. He welcomed them, saying, From the beginning of your birth you strictly observed the vows of celibacy, and although you are experienced in the path of liberation, you are keeping yourselves just like small children. Purtu Maharaj inquired from the sages about persons entangled in this dangerous material existence because of their previous actions. Could such persons, whose only aim is sense gratification, be blessed with any good fortune? Purtu Maharaj continued, My dear sirs, there is no need to ask about your good and bad fortune because you are always absorbed in spiritual bliss. The mental concoction of the auspicious and inauspicious does not exist in you. I am completely assured that personalities like you are the only friends for persons who are blazing in the fire of material existence. I therefore ask you how this material world we can verily 
soon achieve the ultimate goal of life. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is always anxious to elevate the living entities who are his parts and parcels, and for their special benefit the Lord travels all over the world in the form of self-realized persons like you. The great sage Maitreya continued, Thus, son of Kumar, the best of the celibates, after hearing the speech of Parta Maharaj, which was meaningful, appropriate, full of precise words and very sweet to hear, smiled with full satisfaction and began to speak as follows. Sanat Kumara said, My dear King Partu, I am very nicely questioned by you. Such questions are beneficial for all living entities, especially because they are raised by you, who are always thinking of the good of others. Although you know everything, you ask such questions because that is the behaviour of saintly persons. Such intelligence is befitting your position. When there is a congregation of devotees, their discussions, questions and answers become conclusive to both the speaker and the audience. Thus, such a meeting is beneficial for everyone's real happiness. Sanat Kumar continued, My dear King, you already have an inclination to glorify the lotus feet of the lotus personality of Godhead. Such attachment is very difficult to achieve. But when one has attained such unflinching faith in the Lord, it automatically cleanses lusty desires from the core of the heart. It has been conclusively decided in the scriptures, after due consideration, that the ultimate goal of the welfare of human society is detachment from the bodily concept of life, an increased and steadfast detachment for the Supreme Lord, who is transcendental before, beyond the modes of material nature. Attachment for the Supreme can be increased by practicing devotional service inquiring about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, applying Bhakti Yoga in life, worshipping Yogeshwara, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and by hearing and chanting about the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. These actions are pious in themselves. One has to make progress in spiritual life by not associating with persons who are simply interested in sense gratification and making money. Not only such persons, but one who associates with such persons should be avoided. One should mould his life in such a way that he cannot live in peace without drinking the nectar of the glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari. One can be thus elevated by being disgusted with a taste for sense enjoyment. The candidate for spiritual advancement must be non-violent, must follow in the footsteps of great acharyas, must always remember the nectar of the pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, must follow the regulative principles without material desires, and while following the regulative principles should not blaspheme others. A devotee should lead a very simple life and not be disturbed by the duality of opposing elements. He should learn to tolerate them. The devotee should gradually increase the culture of devotional service by constant hearing of the transcendental qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. These pastimes are like ornamental decorations on the ears of devotees. By rendering devotional service and transcending the material qualities, one can easily be fixed in transcendence in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Upon becoming fixed in his attachment to the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the grace of the spiritual master, and by awakening knowledge and detachment, the living entity situated within the heart of the body, and covered by the fire 
five elements burns up his material surroundings, exactly as fire arising from the wood burns the wood itself. When a person becomes devoid of all material desires and liberated from all material qualities, he transcends distinctions between actions executed externally and internally. At the time, the difference between the soul and the super-soul, which was existing before self-realization, is annihilated. When the dream is over, there is no longer a distinction between the dream and the dreamer. When the soul exists for sense gratification, he creates different desires, and for that reason he becomes subjected to designations. But when one is in the transcendental position, he is no longer interested in anything except fulfilling the desires of the Lord. Only because of different causes does a person see a difference between himself and others, just as one sees the reflection of a body appearing differently manifested on water, on oil or in the mirror. When one's mind and senses are attached, attracted to sense objects for enjoyment, the mind becomes agitated. As a result of continually thinking of sense objects, one's real consciousness almost becomes lost, like the water in the lake that is gradually sucked up by the big grass straws on its bank. When one deviates from his original consciousness, he loses the capacity to remember his previous position or recognize his present one. When remembrance is lost, all knowledge acquired is based on a false foundation. When this occurs, learned scholars consider that the soul is lost. There is no stronger obstruction to one's self-interest than thinking other objects matter, matters to be more pleasing than one's self-realization. For human society, constantly thinking of how to earn money and apply it for sense gratification brings about the destruction of everyone's interest. When one becomes devoid of knowledge and devotional service, he enters into the species of life like those of trees and stones. Those who strongly desire to cross the ocean of omniscience must not associate with the modes of ignorance, for hedonistic activities are the greatest obstructions to realization of religious principles, economic development, regulated sense gratification, and at last, liberation. Out of the four principles, namely religion, economic development, sense gratification and liberation, liberation has to be taken very seriously. The other three are subject to destruction by the stringent law of nature, de death. We accept as blessings different states of higher life, distinguishing them from lower states of light. But we should know that such distinctions exist only in relation to the interchange of the modes of material nature. Actually, these states of life have no permanent existence, for all of them will be destroyed by the Supreme Controller. Sanat Kumar advised the king, Therefore, my dear King Partu, try to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is living within everyone's heart along with the individual soul, in each and every body, either moving or non-moving. The individual souls are fully covered by the gross material body and subtle body made of the life, air and intelligence. The Supreme Personality of Godhead manifests himself as one with the cause and effect within this body, but one who has transcended the illusory energy by deliberate consideration which clears the misconception of a snake for a rope can understand that the Paramatma is eternally transcendental to the material creation and situated in pure internal energy. 
Thus the Lord is transcendental to all material contaminations. Unto, unto him only must one surrender. The devotees who are always engaged in the service of the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord can very easily overcome hard-knotted desires for fruitive activities. Because this is very difficult, the non-devotees, the jnanis and yogis, although trying to stop the waves of sense gratification, cannot do so. Therefore, you are advised to engage in the devotional service of Krishna, the son of Vasudeva. The ocean of Nishians is very difficult to cross because it is infested with many dangerous sharks. Although those who are non-devotees undergo severe austerities and penances to cross that ocean, we recommend that you simply take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, which are like boats of cross for crossing the ocean. Although the ocean is difficult to cross by taking shelter of his lotus feet, you will overcome all dangers. The great sage Maitreya continued, being thus enlightened in complete spiritual knowledge by the son of Brahma, one of the Kumaras, who was complete in spiritual knowledge, the king worshipped them in the following words. The king said, O Brahmana, O powerful one, formerly Lord Vishnu showed me his co causeless most mercy, indicating that you would come to my house, and to confirm that blessing, you all have come. My dear Brahmana, you have carried out the order thoroughly because you are also as compassionate as the Lord. It is my duty, therefore, to offer you something. But all I possess are but remnants of food taken by great saintly persons. What shall I give? The king continued, Therefore, my dear Brahmanas, my life, wife, child, home, furniture and household paraphernalia, my kingdom, strength, land, and especially my treasury, I, are all offered unto you. Since only a person who is completely educated according to the principles of Vedic knowledge deserves to be commander-in-chief, ruler of the state, the first to chastise, and the proprietor of the whole planet, Purta Maharaj offered everything to the Kumaras. The Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Sudras eat their food by virtue of the Brahmana's mercy. It is the Brahmanas who enjoy their own property, clothe themselves with their own property and give charity with their own property. Prattu Maharaj continued, How can such persons who have rendered unlimited service by explaining the path of self-realization in relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and whole whose explanations are given for our enlightenment with complete conviction and Vedic evidence be repaid except by folded palms containing water for their satisfaction. Such great personalities can be satisfied only by their own activities, which are distributed amongst human society on their unlimited mercy. The great sage Maitreya continued, being thus worshipped by Maharaj Prithu, the four Kumaras who were masters of devotional service became very pleased. Indeed, they appeared in the sky and praised the character of the king, and everyone observed them. Amongst great personalities, Maharaj Prithu was the chief of virtue of his fixed position in relation to spiritual enlightenment. He remains satisfied as one who has achieved all success in spiritual understanding. Being self-satisfied, Maharaj Prithu executed his duties as perfectly as possible, according to the time and his situation, strength and financial position. His only aim in all his activities was to satisfy the absolute truth. In this way he duly acted.
Maharaj Purtu completely dedicated himself to be an eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, transcendental to material nature. Consequently, all the fruits of his activities were dedicated to the Lord, and he always thought of himself as a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the proprietor of everything. Maharaj Prithu, who was very opulent due to the prosperity of his entire empire, remained at home as a householder, since he was never inclined to utilize his opulences for the gratification of his senses. He remained unattached, exactly like the sun, which is unaffected in all circumstances. Being situated in a liberat liberated position of devotional service, Prithu Maharaj not only performed all fruitive activities, but also also begot five sons by his wife, Archi. Indeed, all his sons were begotten according to his own desire. After begetting five sons named Vijisva, Dumrakeshu, Hariyaksha, Dravina and Vrika, Purtu Maharaj continued to rule the planet. He accepted all the qualities of the deities who governed all other planets. Since Purtu Maharaj was a perfect devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he wanted to protect the Lord's creation by pleasing the various citizens according to their various desires. Therefore, Purtu Maharaj used to please them in all respects by his words, mentally, works and gentle behavior. Maharaj Prithu became as celebrated as king as Somaraj, the king of the moon, who was also powerful and exacting, just like the sun god who distributes heat and light and at the same time exacts all the planetary waters. Maharaj Prithu was so strong and powerful that no one could disobey his orders anymore than one could conquer fire itself. He was so strong that he was compared to Indra, the king of heaven, whose power is insur insurperable. On the other hand, Maharaj Prithu was also as tolerant as the earth, and in feeling various desires of human society, he was like heaven itself. Just as rainfall satisfies everyone's desires, Maharaj Prithu used to satisfy everyone. He was like the sea in that no one could understand his depth, and he was like Meru, the king of hills, in the, fix, in the fixity of his purpose. Maharaj intelligence and education were exactly like that of Yamaraj, the superintendent of death. His opulence was comparable to the Himalayan mountains, where all valuable jewels and mer minerals are stocked. He possessed great riches like Kivera, the treasurer of the heavenly planets, and no one could reveal his secrets, for they were like the demigod Varunas in his bodily strength and in the strength of his senses maharaj prithu was as strong as the wind which can go anywhere and everywhere as far as his intolerance was concerned he was just like the all-powerful rudra expansion of lord shiva or sadashiva in his bodily beauty he was just like Cupid, and in his thoughtfulness he was like a lion. In his affection he was just like Svayambhuvamane, and in his ability to control he was like Lord Brahma. In his personal behaviour, Prithu Maharaj exhibited all good qualities, and in spiritual knowledge he was exactly like Brihaspati. In self-control, he was like the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. As far as his devotional service was concerned, he was a great follower of devotees who were attached to cow protection and the rendering of all service to the spiritual master and the brahmanas. He was perfect in his shyness and in his gentle behavior, and when he engaged in some philanthropic activity, he worked as if he were working for his own personal self. Throughout the whole universe, in the higher, lower and middle planetary systems, Prithu Maharaja's reputation was loudly declared, and all ladies and saintly persons heard his glories, which were as sweet as the glories of Lord 
Ramachandra. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fourth canto, 22nd chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Pratha Maharaja's meeting with the four Kumaras. Chapter 23. Maharaj Prithu is going back home. At the last stage of his life, when Maharaj Prithu saw himself getting old, that great soul, who was king of the world, divided whatever opulence he had accumulated amongst all kinds of living entities, moving and non-moving, he arranged pensions for everyone according to religious principles and after executing the orders of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in complete coordination with him, he dedicated his sons onto the earth, which was considered to be his daughter. Then Maharaja Prithu left the presence of his citizens, who were almost lamenting and crying from feeling of separation from the king and went to the forest alone with his wife to perform austerities. After retiring from family life, Maharaj Prithu strictly followed the regulations of retired life and underwent severe austerities in the forest. He engaged in these activities as seriously as he had formerly engaged in leading the government and conquering everyone. In the top of Vana, Maharaj Prithu sometimes ate the trunks and roots of trees, and sometimes he ate fruit and dried leaves, and for some weeks he drank only water. Finally, he simply lived by breathing air. Following the principles of forest living and the footsteps of the great sages and munis, Prithu Maharaj accepted five kinds of heating processes during the summer season, exposing himself to tolerance of rain in the rainy season, and in the winter stood in water up to his neck. He also used to simply lie down on the floor to sleep. Maharaj Prithu underwent all these severe austerities in order to control his words and his senses, to refrain from discharging his semen and to control the life air within his body. All this he did for the satisfaction of Krishna. He had no other purpose. By thus practicing severe austerities, Maharaj Prithu gradually became steadfast in spiritual life and completely free from all desires for fruitive activities. He also practiced breathing exercises to control his mind and senses, and by such control he became completely free from all desires for fruitive activity. Thus, the best among human beings, Prithu Maharaj, followed that path of spiritual advancement which was advised by Sanat Kumara. That is to say, he worshipped the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Maharaj Prithu, thus engaged completely in devotional service, executing the rules and regulations strictly according to principles, 24 hours a day. Thus his love and devotion onto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, developed and became an affliction unflinching and fixed. By regularly discharging devotional service, Prithu Maharaj became transcendental in mind and can therefore constantly think of the lotus feet of the Lord. Because of this, he became completely detached and attained perfect knowledge by which he could transcend all doubt. Thus he was freed from the clutches of false ego and material conception of life. When he became completely free from the conception of bodily life, Maharaj Prithu realized the Lord Krishna sitting in everyone's heart as a Paramatma being thus able to get all the instructions from him. He gave up all other practices of yoga and jnana. He was not even interested in the perfection of the yoga and jnana systems, for he thoroughly realized the devotional service to Krishna as the ultimate goal of life, and that unless the yogis and jnanis become attracted to Krishna Katha, narrations about Krishna, their illusions concentrating existence can never be dispelled. In due course of time, when Prithu Maharaj was to give up his body, he fixed his mind firmly upon the lotus feet of Krishna, 
and thus completely situated on the Brahmabhuta platform, he gave up the material body. When Maharaj Prithu practiced a particular yogic sitting posture, he blocked the doors of his anus with his ankles, pressed his right and left calves gradually, raising his life air upwards, passing it to the circle of his navel, up to his heart and throat, and finally pushed it upward to the central position between his two eyebrows. In this way, Prithu Maharaj gradually raised his air of life up to the whole of his skull, whereupon he lost all desires for material existence. Gradually he merged his air of life with the totality of air, his body with the totality of earth, and the fire within his body with the totality of fire. In this way, according to the different positions of the various parts of the body, Prithu Maharaj merged the holes of his senses with the sky, his bodily liquids such as blood and various secretions with the totality of water, and he merged earth with water, then water with fire, fire with air, and air with sky, and so on. He amalgamated the mind with the senses and the senses with the sense objects according to their respective positions and he also amalgamated the material ego with the total material energy Mahatattva. Prithu Maharaj then offered the total designation of all living entity onto the supreme control of illusory energy, being released from all the dis designations by which the living entity became entrapped. He became free by knowledge and renunciation and by the spiritual force of his devotional service. In this way, being situated in his original constitutional position of Krishna consciousness, he gave up this body as a prabhu, or controller of the senses. The queen, the wife of Pratha Maharaj, whose name was Archie, followed her husband into the forest. Since she was a queen, her body was very delicate. Although she did not deserve to live in the forest, she voluntarily touched her lotus feet to the ground. Although she was not accustomed to such difficulties, Queen Archie followed her husband in the regulative principles of living in the forest like great sages. She lay down on the ground and ate only fruits, flowers and leaves and became, and because she was not fit for these activities, she became frail and thin. Yet because of the pleasure she derived in serving her husband, she did not feel any difficulties. When Queen Archie saw her that her husband, who had been so merciful to her and the earth, no longer showed symptoms of life, she lamented for a little while and then built a fiery pyre on the top of a hill and placed the body of her husband on it. After this, the queen executed the necessary funerary, funerary functions and offered oblations of water. After bathing in the river, she offered obeisances to the various demigods situated in the sky in the different planetary systems. She then circumambulated the fire and, while thinking of the lotus feet of her husband, entered its flames. After observing this brave act performed by the chaste wife Archie, the wife of the great king Prithu, many thousands of wives of the demigods, along with their husbands, offered prayers to the queen, for they were very much satisfied. At this time the demigods were situ situated on the top of the Mandara hill and all their wives began to shower flowers on the funeral pyre and began to talk among themselves as follows. The wives of the demigods said, All glories to Queen Archi, we can see that this queen of the great King Prithu, the emperor of all kings of the world, has served has severed her husband uh, has served her husband with mind speech and body exactly as the goddess of fortune serves the supreme personality of godhead yogeshwara or vishnu 
The wives of the demigods continued, just see how this chaste lady, Archie, by dint of her inconceivable pious activities, is still following her husband upward, as far as we can see. In this material world, every human being has a short span of life, but those who are engaged in devotional service go back home, back to Godhead. But they are actually on the path of liberation. For such persons, there is nothing which is not available. Any person who engages himself within this material world in performing activities that necessitate that necessitate great struggle and who, after obtaining a human form of life, which is a chance to attain liberation from miseries, undertakes difficult task of fruitive activities, must be considered to be cheated and env envious of his own self. The great sage Maitreya continued speaking. My dear Vajura, when the wives of the denizens in heaven were thus talking among themselves, Queen Archie reached the planet which her husband, Maharaj Prithu, the topmost of self-realized souls, had attained. Maitreya continued, The greatest of all devotees, Maharaj Prithu, was very powerful, and his ca character was liberal, magnificent, and magnanimous. Thus I have described him to you as far as possible. Any person who describes the great characteristics of Prithu Maharaj with faith and determination, whether he reads or hears of them, himself or helps others to hear them, is certainly to attain the very planet which Maharaj Prithu attained. In other words, such a person also returns home to Vaikuntha planets, back to Godhead. If one hears of the characteristics of Prithu Maharaj and is a Brahmana, he becomes perf perfectly qualified with Brahminical powers. If he is a Kshatriya, he becomes a king of the world. If he is a Vaishya, he becomes a master of other Vaishyas and many animals. And if he is a Shudra, he becomes the topmost devotee. It does not matter whether one is a man or a woman. Anyone who with great respect hears this narration of Maharaj Prithu will become the father of many children if he is without children and will become the richest of men if he is without money. Also, one who hears this narration three times will become very reputable if he is not recognized in, soci in society and, if, and he will become a great scholar if he is illiterate. In other words, he hearing of the narration of Prithu Maharaj is so auspicious that it drives away all bad luck. By hearing the narration of Prithu Maharaj, one can become great, increase his duration of life, gain promotion to the heavenly planets and counteract the contaminations of this age of Kali. In addition, one can promote the causes of religion, economic development, sense gratification and liberation. Therefore, from all sides it is advisable for a materialistic person who is interested in such things to read and hear the narrations of the life and character of Prithu Maharaj. If a king who is desirous of attaining victory and ruling power chants the narration of Prithu Maharaj three times before going forth on his chariot, all subordinate kings will automatically render all kinds of taxes onto him as they render them onto Maharaj Prithu, simply upon his order. A pure devotee who is executing the different processes of devotional service may be situated in a transcendental position, being completely absorbed in Krishna consciousness, but even he, while discharging devotional service, might hear must hear and read and induce others to hear about the character and life of Prithu Maharaj. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vijura, I have as far as possible spoken the narrations about Prithu Maharaj, which enrich one's devotional attitude. Whoever takes advantage of these benefits also goes back home, back to Godhead, like Maharaj Prithu. Whoever with great reverence and adoration re regularly leads, chants and describes the history of Maharaj Prithu's activities will certainly increase unflinchingly 
unflinching faith and attraction for the lotus feet of the Lord. The Lord's lotus feet are the boat by which one can cross the ocean of Nisians. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the fourth canto, 23rd chapter. Maharaj Prithu is going back home. Chapter 24. Chanting the song sung by Lord Shiva, also called the Rudra Gita. The great sage Maitreya continues, Vijayasadva, the eldest son of Maharaj Prithu, who had a reputation like his father, became emperor and gave his younger brothers different directions of the world to govern, for he was very affectionate towards his brother. Maharaj Vijitashva offered the eastern part of the world to his brother Haryaksha, the southern part to Dumrakesha, the western part to Vrika and the north part to Dravina. Formerly Maharaj Vijitasa pleased the king of heaven, Indra, and from him received the title Antadhana. His wife's name was Skindanini and by her he begot three good sons. The three sons of Maharaj Anatana were named Bhavaka, Bhavamana and Suchi. Formerly, these three personalities were the demigods of fire, but due to the curse of the great sage Vashishtha, they become the sons of Maharaj Antadhana. As such, they were as powerful as the fire gods, and they attained the destination of mystic yogic power, being again situated as the demigods of fire. Maharaj Antadhana had another wife named Nabhasvati, and by her he was very happy to beget another son named Havirdhana. Since Maharaj Andatana was very liberal, he did not kill Indra while the demigod was stealing his father's horse at the sacrifice. Whenever Andatana, the supreme royal power, had to exact taxes, punish his citizens or fine them severely, he was not willing to do so. Consequently, he retired from the execution of such duties and engaged himself in the performance of different sacrifices. Although Maharaj Andatana was engaged in performing sacrifices, because he was a self-realized soul, he very intelligently rendered devotional service to the Lord. He eradicates all the fears of his devotees. By thus worshipping the Supreme Lord, Maharaj Andatana wrapped in ecstasy and attained his planet very easily. Harvidhana, the son of Maharaj Anantana, had a wife named Havirdhani, who gave birth to six sons named Barhishat, Gaya, Shukala, Krishna, Satya, and Jitravrata. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vijura, Havirdhana was very powerful son, Brihasat was very expert in performing various kinds of fruitive activities and sacrifices, and he was also expert in the practice of mystic yoga. By his great qualities, he became known as Prajapati. Maharaj Barisat executed many sacrifices all over the world. He scattered kusha grasses and kept the tops of the grasses pointed eastward. Maharaj Barhisat, henceforth known as Pachinar Barhi, was ordered by the supreme demigod Lord Brahma to marry the daughter of the ocean named Satajruti. Her bodily features were completely beautiful and she was very young. She was decorated with the proper garments, and when she came into the marriage arena and began circumambulating it, the fire god Agni became so attracted to her that he desired her company, exactly as he had formerly desired to enjoy Shuki. While Satadruti was thus being married, the demons, the denizens and the Gandharva Loka, the great sages and the denizens of the Siddha Loka, the earthly planets, 
and the Naga Loka, although highly exalted, were all captivated by the tinkling of her ankle bells. King Prachanibartha begot ten children in the womb of Satadruti. All of them were equally endowed with religiosity and all of them were known as the Prachetas. When all these Prachetas were ordered by their father to marry and beget children, they all entered the ocean and practiced austerities and penances for 10,000 years. Thus, they worshipped the master of all austerity, the supreme personality of Godhead. When all the sons of the Pachinabrahi left home to execute austerities, they met Lord Shiva, who, out of great mercy, instructed them about the absolute truth. All the sons of Prachinabharti meditated upon the instructions, chanting and worshipping them with great care and attention. Vidura asked Maitreya, My dear Brahmana, why did the Brachetas meet Lord Shiva on the way? Please tell me how the meeting happened, how Lord Shiva became very pleased with them and how he instructed them. Certainly such talks are important, and I wish that you please be merciful upon me and describe them. The great sage Vidura continued, O oh, best of the Brahmanas, it is very difficult for living entities encaged within this material body to have personal contact with Lord Shiva. Even great sages who have no material attachments do not contact him, despite their always being absorbed in meditation to attain his personal contact. Lord Shiva, the most powerful demigod, second only to Lord Vishnu, is self-sufficient. Although he has nothing to aspire for in the material world, for the benefit of those in the material world, he is always busily engaged everywhere and is accompanied by his dangerous energies like Goddess Kali and Goddess Durga. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, because of their pious nature, all the sons of Prajnabhati were very seriously accepted, very seriously accepted the words of their father with heart and soul, and with these words on their heads, they went towards the west to execute their father's order. While travelling, the Prachetas happened to see a great reservoir of water, which seemed almost as big as the ocean. The water of this lake was so calm and quiet that it seemed like the mind of a great soul, and its inhabitants, the aquatics, appeared very peaceful and happy to be under the protection of such a watery reservoir. In that great lake, there were different types of lotus flowers. Some of them were bluish and some of them were red. Some of them grew at night and some in the day and some like the Indivara lotus flower in the evening. Combined together, the lotus flowers filled the lake so full that the lake appeared to be a giant mine of such flowers. Consequently, on the shores there were swans and cranes, Chakravaka, Kandarva, and other beautiful water birds standing about. There were various trees and creepers on all sides of the lake, and there were mad bumblebees humming all about them. The trees appeared to be very jolly due to the sweet humming of the bumblebees, and the saffron, which was contained in the lotus flowers, was being thrown into the air. These all created such an atmosphere that it appeared as though a festival were taking place there. <coughs> The sons of the king became very much amazed when they heard vibrations from the various drums and kettle drums along with other orderly musical sounds pleasing to the ear. 
The Prochertas were fortunate to see Lord Shiva, the chief of the demigods, emerging from the water with his associates. His bodily luster was just like molten gold. His throat was bluish, and he had three eyes which looked very massively upon his devotees. He was accompanied by many musicians who were glorifying him. As soon as the Prochertas saw Lord Shiva, they immediately offered their obeisances in great amazement and fell down at the lotus feet of the Lord. Lord Shiva became very pleased with the Prochertas because generally Lord Shiva is the protector of pious persons and persons of gentle behavior. Being very much pleased with their princesses, he began to speak as follows. Lord Shiva said, you are all the sons of King Prachinabarhi, and I wish all good fortune to you. I also know what you are going to do, and therefore I am visible to you just to show you mercy upon me. Upon you. Lord Shiva continued, any person who surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, the controller of everything, material nature as well as the living entity is actually very dear to me. A person who exercises his occupational duty properly for 100 births becomes qualified to occupy the post of Brahma, and if he becomes more qualified, he can approach Lord Shiva, a person who is directly surrendered to Lord Krishna or Vishnu in an unalloyed devotional service is immediately promoted to the spiritual planets. Lord, Lord Shiva and other demigods obtain these planets after the destruction of this material world. You are all devotees of the Lord, and as such I appreciate that you are as respectable as the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. I know in this way that the devotees who also respect me and that I am dear to them. Thus, no one can be as dear to the devotees as I am. Now I shall chant one mantra which is not only transcendental, pure and auspicious, but is the best prayer for anyone who is aspiring to attain the ultimate goal of life. When I chant this mantra, please hear it carefully and attentively. The great sage Maitreya continued, out of his causeless mercy, the exalted personality, Lord Shiva, the great devotee of Lord Narayana, continued to speak to the king's sons who were standing with folded hands. Lord Shiva addressed the Supreme Personality of Godhead with the following prayer. Oh, Supreme Personality of Godhead, all glory is unto you. You are the most exalted of all self-realized souls. Since you are always auspicious for the self-realized, I wish that you be auspicious for me. You are worshipable by virtue of the all-perfect instructions you give. You are the super-soul. Therefore, I offer my obeisances unto you as the supreme living being. My Lord, you are the origin of the creation by virtue of the lotus flower which sprouts from your navel. You are the supreme controller of the senses and the sense objects, and you are also the all-pervading Vasudeva. You are most peaceful, and because of your self-illuminating existence, you are not disturbed by the six kinds of transformations. My dear Lord, you are the origin of the subtle material ingredients, the master of all in integration as well as the master of all disintegration, the predominating deity named Shankarshan and the master of all intelligence, known as the predominating deity Pradyumna. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. My Lord, as the supreme directing deity known as Anirudha, you are the master of the senses and the mind. I therefore offer my obeisances unto you again and again. You are known as Ananta, as, the, as well as Shankarshan, because of your ability to destroy the whole creation by the bla blazing fire from your mouth. My Lord, O Aniruddha, you are the authority by which the doors of the higher planetary systems and liberation are opened. You are always within the pure heart of the living entity. Therefore, I offer my obeisances unto you. You are the possessor of semen which is like gold, and thus, in the form of fire, you help the Vedic sacrifices, beginning with Chaturpotra, 
Therefore, I offer my obeisances unto you. My Lord, you are the prov provider of the Pitralokas as well as all the demigods. You are the predominant deity of the moon and the master of all three Vedas. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you because you are the original source of satisfaction for all living entities. My dear Lord, you are the gigantic universal form which contains all the individual bodies of the living entities. You are the maintainer of the three worlds, and as such you maintain the mind, senses, body and air of life within them. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, by expanding your transcendental vibrations, you reveal the actual meaning of everything. You are the all-pervading sky within and without. You are the unlimited bowl of pious activities executed both within this material world and beyond it. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances again and again unto you. My dear Lord, you are the view of the results of pious activities. You are inclination, disinclination, and their resultant activities. You are the cause of the material conditions of life caused by irreligion, and therefore you are death. I offer you my respectful obeisances. My dear Lord, you are the topmost of all bestowers of all benediction, the oldest and supreme enjoyer amongst all enjoyers. You are the master of all the world's metaphysical philosophy, for you are the supreme cause of all causes, Lord Krishna. You are the greatest of all religious principles, the supreme mind, and you have a brain which is never checked by any condition. Therefore, I repeatedly offer my obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, you are the supreme controller of the worker, the sense activities and results of sense activities, karma. Therefore, you are the controller of the body, mind and senses. You are also the supreme controller of egotism, known as Rudra. You are the source of knowledge in the activities of the Vedic injunctions. My dear Lord, I wish to see you exactly in the form that your very dear devotees worship. You have many other forms, but I wish to see your form that is especially liked by the devotees. Please be merciful upon me and show me that form, for only that form worshipped by the devotees can perfectly satisfy all the demands of the senses. The Lord's beauty resembles a dark cloud during the rainy season. As a rainfall glistens, his bodily features also glisten. Indeed, he is the sum total of all beauty. The Lord has four arms that an exquisitely beautiful face, with eyes like lotus petals, a beautiful highly raised nose, a mind attracting smile, a beautiful forehead, and equally beautiful and fully decorated ears. The Lord is super excellently beautiful on account of his open and merciful smile and his sidelong glances upon his devotees. His black hair is curly and his garments waving in the wind appear like flying saffron pollen from lotus flowers. His glistening earrings, shining helmets, bangles, garlands, ankle bells, waist belts and various other bodily ornaments combine with conch shell, disc, club and lotus flower to increase the natural beauty of the kastupa pearl on his chest. The Lord has shoulders just like a lion's. Upon these shoulders are garlands, necklaces and epaulets, and all of these are always glittering. Besides these, there is the beauty of the Kastupa Muni per money pearl, 
and on the dark chest of the Lord there are streaks named Srivasa, which are signs of the Goddess of Fortune. The, glistening of the glittering of these streaks excels the beauty of the golden streaks on a golden testing stone. Indeed, such beauty defeats a gold testing stone. The Lord's abdomen is beautiful due to three ripples in the flesh being so round. His abdomen resembles the leaf of a banyan tree, and when he exhales and inhales, the movement of the ripples appear very, very beautiful. The coils within the navel of the Lord are so deep that it appears that the entire universe sprouted out of it and yet again wishes to go back. The lower part of the lo Lord's waist is dark and covered with yellow garments and a bel belt bedecked with golden embroidery work. His symmetrical lotus feet and the calves, thighs and joints of his legs are extraordinarily beautiful. Indeed, the Lord's entire body appears to be well built. My dear Lord, your two lotus feet are so beautiful that they appear like blossoming petals of the lotus flower which grows during the autumn season. Indeed, the nails of your lotus feet emanate such a great effulgence that they immediately dissipate all the darkness in the heart of a conditioned soul. My dear Lord, kindly show me that form of yours which always dissipates all kinds of darkness in the heart of a devotee. My dear Lord, you are the supreme spiritual master of everyone. Therefore, all conditioned souls covered with the darkness of ignorance can be enlightened by, your, by you as spiritual master. My dear Lord, those who desire to purify their existence must always engage in meditating upon your lotus feet, as described above. Those who are serious about executing their occupational duties and who want freedom from fear must take to this process of bhakti yoga. My dear Lord, the king of, in charge of the heavenly kingdom is also desirous of obtaining the ultimate goal of life. Devotional service. Similarly, you are the ultimate destination of those who identify themselves with you, Ahamba Masmi. However, it is very difficult for them to attain you, whereas a devotee can very easily attain your lordship. My dear Lord, pure devotional service is even difficult for liberated persons to discharge. But devotional service alone can satisfy you who will take to other processes of self-realization if he is actually serious about the perfection of life. Simply, by expansion of his eyebrows, invincible time, personified, can immediately vanquish the entire universe. However, formidable time does not approach the devotee who has taken complete shelter at your lotus feet. If one, by chance, associates with a devotee even for a fraction of a moment, he no longer is subject to attraction by the results of karma or jnana. What interest, then, can he have in the benedictions of the demigods who are subject to the laws of birth and death? My dear Lord, your lotus feet are the cause of all auspicious things and the destroyer of all the contamination of sin. I therefore beg your Lordship to bless me by the association of your devotees who are completely purified by worshipping your lotus feet and who are so merciful upon the conditioned souls. I think that your real benediction will be to allow me to associate with such devotees. The devotees whose heart has been completely cleansed by the process of devotional service and who is favoured by Bhakti Devi does not become bewildered by the external energy, which is just like the dark well. Being completely cleansed by all, of all material contamination in this way, a devotee is able to understand very happily your name, fame, form, activities, etc. 
пронизывает собой всю Вселенную и в котором проявляется вся Вселенная, суть ты. My dear Lord, the impersonal Brahman spreads everywhere, like the sunshine of the sky. And that impersonal Brahman, which spreads throughout the universe, in which the entire universe is manifested, is you. My dear Lord, you have manifold energies, and these energies are manifested in manifold forms. With such energies, you have also created this cosmic manifestation, and although you maintain it as if it were permanent, you ultimately annihilate it. Although you are never disturbed by such changes and alterations, the living entities are disturbed by them, and therefore they find the cosmic manifestation to be different or separated from you. My Lord, you are always independent, and I can clearly see this fact. My dear Lord, your universal form consists of all five elements, the senses, mind, intelligence, false ego, which is material, and the Paramatma, your partial expansion, who is the director of everything. Yogis other than the devotees, namely the Karma Yogi and Jnana Yogi, worship you by their respective actions in their respective positions. It is stated both in the Vedas and in the Shastras that are corollaries of the Vedas, and indeed everywhere, that it is only you who are to be worshipped. That is the expert version of all the Vedas. My dear Lord, you are the only Supreme Person, the cause of all causes, before the creation of this universe, this material world, your material energy remains in a dormant condition. When your material energy is agitated, the three qualities, namely goodness, passion and ignorance, act and as a result, the total material energy, egotism, ether, air, fire, water, earth and all the various demigods and saintly persons becomes manifest, thus the material world is created. My dear Lord, after creating by your own potencies, you enter within the creation in four kinds of forms. Being within the hearts of the living entities, you know them and know how they are enjoying their senses. The so-called happiness of this material creation is exactly like the bee's enjoyment of honey after it has been collected in the honeycomb. My dear Lord, your absolute authority cannot be directly experienced but one can guess by seeing the activities of the world that everything has been destroyed in due course of time. The force of time is very strong and everything has been destroyed by something else. Just as one animal has been eaten by another animal, time scatters everything, exactly as the wind scatters clouds in the cloud in the sky. My dear Lord, all living entities within this material world are mad after planning for things, and they are always busy with the desire to do this or that. This is due to uncontrollable greed. The greed for material enjoyment is always existing in the living entity, but your Lordship is always alert, and in due course of time you strike him just as a snake seizes a mouse and very easily swallows him. My dear Lord, any learned person knows that unless he worships you, his entire life is spoiled. Knowing this, how can he give up worshipping your lotus feet? Even our father, the spiritual and spiritual master, Lord Brahma, unhesitatingly worshipped you, and the fourteen Manus followed in his footsteps. My dear Lord, all actually learned persons know you as the Supreme Brahman and the Super Soul, although the entire universe is afraid of Lord Rudra, 
who ultimately annihilates everything. For the learned devotees, you are the fearless destination of all. My dear sons of the king, just execute your occupational duty as kings with a pure heart. Just chant this prayer, fixing your mind on the lotus feet of the Lord. That will bring you all good fortune, for the Lord will be very much pleased with you. Therefore, O sons of the King, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, is situated in everyone's hearts. He is also within your hearts. Therefore, chant the glories of the Lord and always meditate upon Him continuously. My dear princes, in the form of a prayer, I have delineated the yoga system of chanting the holy name. All of you should take this important stotra within your minds and promise to keep it in order order to become great sages. By acting silently like a great sage and by giving attention and reverence, you should practice this method. This prayer was first spoken to us by Lord Brahma, the master of all creators. The creators headed by Brigu were instructed in these prayers because they wanted to create. When all the Prajapatis were ordered to create by Lord Brahma, we chanted these prayers in praise of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and became completely free from all ignorance, as we were able to create different types of living entities. The devotee of Lord Krishna, whose mind is always absorbed in him, who with great attention and reverence chants the stotra prayer will achieve the greatest perfection of life without delay. In this material world there are different types of achievement, but of all of them the achievement of knowledge is considered to be the highest, because one can cross the ocean of omniscience only on the boat of knowledge, otherwise the ocean is impassable. Although rendering devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and worshipping Him are very difficult, if one vibrates or simply reads the stotra prayer composed and sung by me, he will very easily be able to invoke the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the dear most objective of all auspicious benedictions. A human being who sings this song sung by me can please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Such a devotee being fixed in the Lord's devotional service can acquire whatever he wants from the Supreme Lord. A devotee who rises early in the morning and with folded hands chants these prayers sung by Lord Shiva and gives facility to others to hear them certainly becomes free from all bondage to creative activities. My dear sons of the King, the prayers I have recited to you are meant for pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Super Soul. I advise you recite these prayers, which are effective as great austerities. In this way, when you are mature, your life will be successful, and you will certainly achieve all your desires and objectives without fail. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purpose of the fourth canto, 24th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Chanting the Songs, sung by Lord Shiva. So, this is the end of this chapter, sung by Lord Shiva. And next we will go on to what we were talking about at the start, the story of how the different enemies take over the body. And so these prayers chanted by Lord Shiva are a great remedy against our material disease and this material contamination. So for those who have the desire, they can read these prayers but you shouldn't accept, expect some sort of reward for this because then our prayers won't be pure. Those sorts of desires can bewilder us. We should just 
offer these prayers to celebrate the Lord and to get the opportunity to serve the Lord. These should be our motives. They should be connected to the spiritual science, not material desires that I will read these prayers and then I'll get whatever I want. So our desires might still be contaminated by material desires. So we shouldn't risk thinking like this, but genuinely pray, Dear Lord, please give me the benediction of these prayers and to give my mind the desire to serve you and to serve the devotees and people in general. And such motives are definitely going to bring us spiritual benefit. Okay, so now we will finish our reading, and in some time we are having an amazing uh, meeting with an incredible person. In the, in the world he's known as Oleg Gennadievich Torsunov, and he has sh uh, showed mercy to us, our listeners, and those who are reading and those who are leading this marathon to bless us with this presence. So prepare your questions and we will uh, compile them. I'm sure there'll be loads of questions and they'll probably be connected to uh, not exactly God and they could be to do with health because he's known as a great uh, doctor of Ayurveda. So these sorts of questions are to be expected. So I'll be the leading uh, these questions and I'll be combining these questions with the spiritual topics. So we're not uh, diving back into this material world to try to enjoy this world. We'll try to be tying this all to the spiritual theme and with God. Thank you all to listening. Thank you all for listening and uh, all glories to you.